So welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're joined by Kimberly Enico, who's come across to us from NASA Ames. Kimberly got a BS from John Hopkins and uh, did her PhD work at Cambridge University in the UK. Uh, and then uh, came back and did a uh, postdoc at uh, University of Arizona. Uh, she was just talking to me before about her own REU experience, which uh, turned her in uh, the direction that her career has taken ever since. She got the chance to work on uh, infrared instrumentation uh, with applications to astronomy and, and most likely to uh, planetary science. She joined uh, NASA Ames in uh, 2000 and in 2009 um, was in charge of the calibration uh, and uh, preparation of the instruments on board the Elcross uh, shepherding satellite uh, and was crucial, her intervention was crucial in getting the final uh, photographs of the shadowed crater that the Elcross shepherding spacecraft crashed into. Uh, but she's not going to talk to us about that because uh, her life in the last 12 months has taken another turn, her scientific career. She's now uh, spent uh, her uh, the last uh, at least six months in, at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where she's heading back next week as well. She's working there with Alan Stern on uh, the topic of her talk today, uh, which is how to utilize uh, commercial opportunities in uh, suborbital flight. So if you'll join me in welcoming Kim. So uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about is just something that I, I I stumbled into. It's not my background, um, but I find it extremely interesting and it's extremely current. And um, I asked about the scientist, the engineer, because I want to give the scope of commercial suborbital vehicles and the applications for science and engineering and technology and research and, 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 and even education. Um, but as scientists, we're, we're taught to be curious. You know, we're curious, we ask questions. And then what is our goals? Our goals are to solve problems. And how do you solve problems? You solve problems by looking at them in a different way. And so what I hope with the end of my talk, you'll get an idea that there may be different ways to solve problems that um, you hadn't even thought of before, new problems, because these new vehicles are potentially changing the venue to carry out experiments, and they're happening today. It's a picture of myself and uh, Sam Durant. Sam Durant is an astronaut who flew on two missions in the 1990s. Um, I was an undergraduate at Hopkins, and he was my junior thesis advisor. And uh, we got to, you know, we got reacquainted at the opening of Spaceport America. This is a spaceport based in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and they had the ribbon cutting ceremony just this last October. It's going to be the venue for where Virgin Galactic is going to be flying out in Armadillo Aerospace, as well as a bunch of sounding rockets. So I just wanted to show you that I'm in throughout my talk, I'll have a lot of dates. All the information I'm showing you is in the public domain. And the dates are relevant because there are things happening extremely fast in this arena. This is an outline of my talk. So to work on language and trying to understand what is meant by suborbital. So what is suborbital? Suborbital is describing, I'm using this term to describe anything that reaches the edge of space and it moves through the atmosphere from which you've launched whatever you're launching, your spaceship, your rocket, what have you. Um, you're not traveling fast enough to <clears throat> go into orbit around the body. And uh, this is shown with um, you know, Isaac Newton, uh, the father of gravity. Um, this is an, an image that's adapted from his uh, treatise um, uh, showing if you had a cannonball and you were going to accelerate it, at what speed would it go into orbit around the Earth? And the trajectories that are shown by A and B are, are what we would call today suborbital, suborbital. You're not going fast enough and you just fall back to the planet. Eventually, if you go fast enough, it's 17,500 17, miles per hour, you'll go into orbit around the Earth. 
And if you go even fast enough, you can even escape the gravity. I mean, this is just basic understanding of what we're going to use the term suborbital. Now, suborbital is nothing new. I mean, we've been doing suborbital science research and engi uh, engineering since the 1950s, and it's ongoing on today. On the left here is a sounding rocket launched from NASA's WALPS flight facility in Virginia, um, carrying on a scientific payload, doing a lot of studies of the atmosphere. You can do some Earth science, you can do planetary science, heliophysics, and the like. Suborbital also uh, balloons. We do a lot of balloon um, experiments, and these fly up at the, the higher altitudes above which air, aircraft can fly. And of course, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Alan Shepard's historic flight. This was a suborbital flight. Alan Shepard, our first American in space, did not go into orbit around the planet. He only reached 187 kilometers, and his flight was 16 minutes long. He had to wait another 10 years before he would go to the moon on Apollo 14. So suborbital is nothing new. It's been around. And it's not just American. It's international as well. Over here is just highlighting some of the places where this is uh, the the MAXIS program, it's a German-Swedish program launching from a strange uh, spaceport in northern Sweden. Um, Japan has a very active sounding rocket and balloon program. Australia, Norway, they launch uh, scientific uh, experiments on sounding rockets and balloons every year. So suborbital is not new, nor is it constrained to the US. It's quite all over the planet. Which makes you wonder, how do you actually do all these things? So we have a geopolitical system in place called spaceports. And spaceports is a way to regulate the airspace from the planet to space so you can carry out these, these investigations. And this is just to highlight spaceports across the, the world. And in particular, number four showing here is Cape Canaveral, where the shuttle is launched from, and all our unmanned um, rockets uh, mostly are, are launched from. Uh, Belkanor, number 14 over here in Kazakhstan, is where the Soyuz and also a lot of the unmanned uh, satellites are launched from. So we have a very active launch capability. Where you, la where you launch on the planet tells you where, what orbit you should go in, what's accessible. So you want to have different types of spaceports all over the globe. There's a lot of activity going on, because this is a picture from the federal, the FAA. Um, the Federal Aviation Administration, it's, this was dated from just last summer, uh, showing the spaceports, the 21st century US spaceports. Um, which ones are federal, which ones are non-federal, which who are applying for grants to uh, you know, have access to space, because there are these emerging space companies that are coming on board. In order to launch their vehicles, they need to have regulations to allow them to go into space. So it's, it's quite active. And I mentioned earlier, I, um, I was able to go to this uh, runway dedication of Spaceport America, which is in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And this is where uh, Virgin Galactic um, is planning to uh, do their flights from. It's also going to host um, um, other companies and sounding rockets as well. Um, and um, at the opening ceremony, Sir Richard Branson is the CEO of the company. Lori Garver, the deputy administrator of NASA, was there. The Senator Bill Richardson from New Mexico, he was the, senator, the governor at the time, um, he uh, you know, was there for the opening ceremonies. So that was pretty exciting to see this activity going on. I wanted to show you uh, something that happened just last month, May, May 20th, 2011, just last month. This is at Spaceport America. It is a sounding rocket, a sounding rocket um, that featured experiments for middle schools, high school um, students that they worked on all year. And it's only a 15 minute ride and got up to about 70 miles into the atmosphere. But I wanted to show you the picture that these students had worked on these experiments throughout the year with their teachers. And now within the end of the school year, during the, the end of the school year, they were able to fly their instruments. What's also kind of neat um, is a, this parabolic uh, craft. It would, rise for about 15 minutes and fall back down again, again not fast enough to leave the Earth's gravity. It's collected by um, a helicopter that found it and then they brought it back on a truck. And you can see within minutes of their payload going into near space that the students are able to get their hands on their um, experiment. And this is a very powerful image because this is what these new commercial reusable suborbital vehicles will be offering you. The opportunity to get your hands on your payload within an hour of what you've flown. 
So you can get, you can look at it. And this is very interesting if you have a biological payload where you need access to it because it's been in a cryogenic state or what have you, and you need to have put it back in the refrigerator. It's got um, interesting thinking, you know, what sort of payloads could I fly on a vehicle that I could have that sort of access. The other thing they're promising is the ability to fly it again that same week or perhaps that same day, sort of like how we go to an airport and have aircraft. You see aircrafts come in and out. Just imagine if you have a payload that you'll fly, you put it into space, to near space, it comes down, you want to fly it again and get another measurement that same day or multiple times during the week. This has not happened before. It's a very different way of approaching. So you can sort of see that um, you get a lot of uh, people involved in that. So I just want to show that, again, this is happening right now. I should also call attention that if you do a Google search on suborbital, you will also uh, bring up NASA's airborne program, which is, um, yes, so they don't actually go into near space. They don't go that high. However, they do uh, satisfy the other criteria of suborbital. They're moving through the atmosphere of our planet. They're not traveling fast enough to escape gravity, and therefore they don't go into orbit. So we are also doing lots of very good science with high altitude aircraft. And I just call your attention, I have lots of links at the bottom of all my slides, and I'm told all the slides will be made available. These are wonderful links to find out how, if you're a scientist who wants to do some atmospheric science, you can fly payloads on UAVs like Global Hawk or a piloted high altitude aircraft like the WB-57 or the ER-2. And then we have the Stratospheric um, Observatory for Infra Astronomy, which I'm involved in. Again, these are not really suborbital, they're aircraft science, but they do fall in this realm of looking at platforms to enable scientific investigations. So in summary, here's a nice cut through of the, our atmosphere from Earth going all the way up to orbit. We're talking for airplanes, they're at 35,000 feet, six to seven miles. The weather balloons, our high altitude balloons, they go up to about 100,000 feet. Talking about going into the suborbital range, we want to go up to 300,000 feet, 100 kilometers. And then in comparison, if you want to, you're in orbit, this is the typical um, elevation at a million feet um, for satellites. So suborbital science. I'm a scientist. I thought this was very fascinating. So I attended this conference in March. And I got to meet scientists who were interested in this, you know, can I fly my experiment on a suborbital platform? And I found that they fell into two categories. Science that's enabled by access to 100 kilometers. This could be an earth science application, looking back at the earth, studying climate, sampling the atmosphere, or looking at the sun, looking away. Or observational science, astronomy or planetary science, looking away from the planet. Um, or even in astrobiology, you know, sampling what is DNA doing at the edge of space during unique environments. So there's certainly a category about access to the altitude that's unique. There's also a science that's enabled by periods of micro or zero gravity, because in this parabolic uh, profile, you'll get four to five minutes of zero gravity, because you're in a free fall period. What can you do with an experiment with four to five minutes of microgravity? A lot of this has to do with biology, um, you know, understanding how certain things behave in the absence of gravity. Here we're so logged into the Earth with one gravity that certain things, when you remove the gravity, other things come to play. It's a lot of fundamental biology, fundamental physics. Fluids act differently. Fuels act differently. Um, uh, particles move together differently. Different forces, once you've removed gravity from the equation, you've got whole new types of physics to, to probe. Uh, human physiology, understanding how the human body responds to changes in G is uh, a known, you know, uh, an area of research that the, you know, the astronaut corps, they've been studying, and now we might have all these pa uh, passengers going into suborbital space. There's a lot of areas to probe in what's going on with human physiology um, and material science. In both cases, technology development, education, and the workforce development, you know, cover the gamut. So it's just another breakdown. So suborbital science is not just astronomy, not just planetary science. It really is a lot of different fields. It's very cross-cutting. I want to highlight two examples 
of suborbital science. Um, there are so many on, at this conference that I just selected two to give one example from each of the, the different fields. So from the high altitude range, um, in the mid-1990s, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which is to study gamma rays, which are these high energetic explosions going on when neutron stars are colliding with each other or, or uh, black holes are you know, swallowing things. They're at the you know, cosmological distance, these huge energies. We learned that um, gamma rays were being generated by our own Earth. And it was, it was such a surprise to the scientists. And it turns out they're, they, we don't really know how they start. We measured them. But they're related to lightning storms. And then in the, have you have a lightning storm in the presence of a strong electric field. The electric field is accelerating electrons in the atmosphere, which then collide with the the molecules in our own atmosphere and release these gamma rays. And we have these energies going on. We don't know anything about the, the metrics or the mechanisms behind them. So um, Joanne Hill at Goddard put in a proposal. Um, so she would like to fly a gamma ray instrument and an optical instrument and a radio instrument at the same time, put it on one of these vehicles, have this vehicle fly multiple times, and from the vantage point of 60, uh, at 100 kilometers, you can look back and take monitoring what these gamma rays are doing and how they're related to um, lightning storms. Um, in fact, this is a very interesting way of looking at our atmosphere from the phenomena that's going on in our atmosphere. We have aircraft that flies through storms. I've got a friend at the University of Miami, and he flies in those planes that go through the eyes of hurricanes. It's like the coolest thing. And uh, so we do a lot of wonderful things right there. We fly um, oops, sorry, uh, balloons as well, going up into the strat stratosphere. These suborbital vehicles are starting to go up into the mesosphere and the thermosphere. And where these terrestrial gamma ray flashes are are supposed to exist are down here. So you can sort of look down on them. It's quite different. In fact, ESA is actually going to put an instrument on the International Space Station in 2014 to study this phenomenon. But it'll, you know, now you can do them with different vantage points. To give you a feel for, you know, if you were to go on one of these, so some of these vehicles you can, um, it's human rated. Other ones you just fly an unmanned. So you can put your camera up. Just to give you a sense, again, can you look at a problem differently? And if you look at a problem differently, you'll probably find a solution for it. Um, the top left is something we're familiar with, just looking out of an aircraft, uh, 35,000 feet. It's lovely. Whenever I'm on a plane, I always love to get the window on a, on a plane because I, I just stare at it. I just think it's beautiful, the clouds. Um, the top right is a balloon. And this was quite a fun story um, at Cambridge University. Uh, that's where I did my PhD, but in 2008, December, 11 and 12 year olds, as part of a school project, they designed, um, they made these teddy knots. They designed instrumentation to put on their teddy bears, you know, temperatures and pressures, and they hooked on a GPS unit, and it flew for like two hours, and it got up to 100,000 feet, and they took pictures of back home, Earth. And then it safely came down, and they retrieved the instruments. And, um, and in some cases, um, some of the students designed the spacesuits. You know, sort of had a, a different past, a lot of different ways of looking at problems. Um, the lower left is what's expected for these commercial suborbital vehicles. And finally, to round it out, this is the view from the International Space Station of our home planet. This is Hurricane Felix back in September of 2007. The other part of science, so you have the high altitude science bit, and I just gave you a flavor of that. You have the microgravity science. Now, microgravity science has been around as well. We have two other ways to do microgravity science. Uh, drop towers. Literally, these are towers that are, um, let's see, 400, NASA Glenn has one that's 432 feet tall, 132 meters. And Bremen, Germany has one that's 110 meters, 360 feet tall. You basically drop something and it experiences free fall. And it gives you microgravity up to about five seconds, one to five seconds. So you can do some very interesting physics there. Um, we also have aircraft that go into these parabolic arcs. And with these parabolic arcs, they give you moment, they give you 20 to 30 seconds of zero gravity. And you get a couple, you get you know, dozens of these on an actual flight. Um, here's an example of, of ESA training, um, doing some experiments. And you fly along with your experiments. So um, you know, these periods of microgravity um, are enabled by these two ground-based facilities. So here's an example of a microgravity spotlight. 
something I was working on. So I did this detail at SWERI. I packaged three payloads for suborbital vehicles. One was a remote sensing camera. The other one was a biomedical harness to measure my, um, you know, my, my uh, blood pressure and my, uh, my heart rate. And the third one was uh, to look at what would happen, how would you, could you make um, a rubble pile asteroid? So uh, we have this image of Itakawa, a uh, 200 meter size object imaged by the Hayabusa, Japanese Hayabusa spacecraft. Um, it's a, an asteroid that surely shows lacks of craters. Um, it has a different kind of formation um, than the other larger asteroids we're seeing. Um, what was interesting is if you were to zoom in on it um, and look at the fragments of the rocks on the five meter scale, they seem to have a particular orientation, a size, uh, two to square root of two to one. And then there's a si researchers who then go to these impact uh, plate, uh, they shoot um, ballistics into a surface and create these uh, particles that come out. And when they look at that, they have the same kind of size distribution. So we wanted to know is what happens in a microgravity environment. So we're basically putting um, a bunch of these known size and in some case unknown size objects in a box. Um, and it's going to fly on the Blue Origin vehicle. And uh, so it'll have four to five minutes of gravity. And cameras will be taking pictures. So you're interested in how these rocks are going to reorientate themselves in microgravity. And then practice imaging techniques so when you send a probe to an asteroid in the future, you could rely on some imaging techniques to understand what's going on. So that was an interesting, um, interesting project. It'll fly later this year. Just to give you a size, I mean, this is the International Space Station. This is the size of the, the capsule that NASA and other entities are working on compared to one of these places that we might visit. So these are certainly quite interesting applications you know, from a scientific point of view, but also when you, when you want to go to visit these places. Finally, uh, microgravity science made it to the NASA image of the day a couple weeks ago. This is on the International Space Station. Um, you have a 30 millimeter droplet of fuel. As it burns, it gets smaller, creates foot, soot, and then the particles combine and, and spiral away. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting science that can be done um, from microgravity and high altitude. So, the next big area is this commercial suborbital. And I'm going to introduce, um, I mean, names that I didn't even know about um, six months ago. And it was really interesting to meet a lot of the individuals involved in this. So when I use the term commercial suborbital, these are these vehicles that are under development right now, today. Um, they are reusable. So they're promising these high flight rates, rapid turnaround, and to fly on demand. Now, we haven't had this capability before. And uh, so if you wanted to you know, go and observe a particular phenomena, they were eventually going to offer this. They all uh, support unmanned payloads. And uh, some are uh, allowing human-tended experiments, a la the payload specialist approach that we had with the shuttle program. Um, and they're all advertising lower cost. So who are the players? I don't know if anyone recognizes these vehicles. Um, they are certainly very different. And what's really neat, I'm highlighting five here. There have been others that have you know, come and gone. And there's probably more still to come. But these are the five contenders that are active right now. And they're all different, all different shapes and sizes, approaches. It's, it's fascinating. You have Virgin Galactic, X-Core Aerospace, Armadillo Aerospace. Mastin Space Systems, and Blue Origin. I have a slide on each of one of those to highlight some of the, to give you a feel for these companies, because they're all very different. They all have different models, uh, business models, who they want with their clientele. So in each of the slides, I'll have this little uh, uh, star on the side. That's when the first test flights for the vehicle that they're advertising to the suborbital community are available. So Armadillo Aerospace. CEO is John Carmack of ID Software. The company was founded in 2000. Uh, it's, it does its research and development out of Caddo Mills, Texas, and eventually will fly its vehicles at a spaceport, uh, spaceport America, New Mexico. Uh, they won the Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander Challenges back in 2008 and 2009. And right now, they have a parallel development between the Supermod and the Stig. 
these are, you know, they're doing two different development paths, trying to get to where they want to go. And I, I call out that's a vertical takeoff, vertical landing, um, and it's unpiloted, unmanned. So this is a picture of a test that they did of the STIG, which is a hover test, just in March. And this last month the, on the SuperMod, they were doing some static testing. So these are active in development. Blue Origin, um, they have their headquarters up in Kent, Washington, out of Seattle. Um, their CEO is Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com. Um, and NASA's been interested in Blue Origin because they've been put, they have an innovative pusher launch abort system. Uh, Blue Origin also would like to do orbital work, and they recently won NASA CC Dev 2 um, award to develop their orbital vehicles. But from a suborbital range, they are um, assisting in uh, doing some scientific uh, research. And uh, their first vehicles are vertical takeoff, vertical landing, unpiloted, and then they're eventually going to potentially take humans as part of their market, um, their market plan. Um, their design is, is loosely based on the DCX. Uh, they were only founded uh, in 2000. Uh, they do their um, work out of West Texas. And um, I mentioned Blue Origin earlier. Um, what the payloads that I worked on during my detail um, are going to fly on the Blue Origin vehicle. So I, I got to learn a lot about um, how they operate. It's quite neat. Maston Space Systems, the CEO is David Maston. He's formerly an IT manager at Cisco Systems. He's from the Bay Area. So you kind of hear, you know, this entrepreneurial Bay Area kind of theme going on. Um, the company was only founded in 2004, and they do a lot of their uh, research and development at Mojave in Southern California. They've had a lot of different, uh, different um, uh, vehicles through their development system. The Zoe, and then they also had the Zombie, and both the Zoe and the Zombie won these Lunar um, Centennial Prizes. Um, but the one that they're doing for... Um, Suborbital research is the Zero. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and just last month, and there's a YouTube video about this too, uh, this is when they were doing some tethered flights of this vehicle um, to qualify it. Again, just last month, so these are very active. Virgin Galactic is probably the more well-known of it all because of the name, Sir Richard Branson. He's the CEO of the Virgin Group. The company Virgin Galactic was only founded in 2004. Um, here's a different approach. This is a horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing. In fact, though, it's uh, brought up by the carrier ship, the White Knight 2, and this is Spaceship 2. That brings it up to alt altitude, and then um, the Spaceship 2 drops and fires its rocket, and then goes into its suborbital path, and then comes back like a glider. Um, this is based on uh, their collaboration with Scaled Composites, who built Spaceship 1, that won the, the, the X Prize. Um, <clears throat> So their R&D is in Mojave. They're going to be flying out of New Mexico. Their market is space tourism. They're, they've been taking bookings since 2005, and they have 430 people signed up for it. So um, notable notes is that they've been in testing for a while, but they, um, it's been quite exciting. Um, you can go to this website down here. Uh, Scale Composites gives a, a running list of all the tests it's been doing. And even today, it posted today that they just did two flights within, two tethered flights within one day. So again, it's this whole thing of trying to say, we're going to fly often. Um, in October 20th, October 20th of last year, they did their first glide test. May 4th of this year, they did their first feathered flight, which is how this glider comes back to Earth. It's a unique, innovative way. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, they just did their second, and I, heard, I learned today that they've just continued doing that. Um, if you were kind of not following the news, in April of this year, when SFO Terminal 2 got opened up to Virgin Galactic, um, Spaceship 2 and White Knight 2 came to visit the Bay Area and landed at SFO. This is the picture of that. Um, the fifth on the list, I just did them in alphabetical order, is X-Core. X-Core, um, this is a horizontal takeoff, horizontal um, landing, and it's also piloted. This is going to take two people up in space. Um, Jeff Greeson, uh, formerly of Intel, um, is CEO of that. Um, this company, x has been around since 1999, but their, their main product is uh, making reusable rocket engines. Um, they've been involved in experimental aircraft like the Easy Rocket and the X-Racer. Um, their R&D home base is in Mojave. Um, but they're, when they get their Lynx vehicle running, they're advertising that they just need a runway that's 24, 
2,400 meters in length, 7,900 feet. So, because they're planning on, you know, they have a lot of international co connections to have their vehicle loaned out to lots of airports. Um, they just had a recent milestone a couple months ago. Again, they're like a rocket engine development company. Um, this was a cryogenic piston pump um, that's going to be used on the Lynx vehicle. Um, they're going to hopefully start um, their um, testing in next year. Um, to round up the commercial space, because these are this area, we have to mention the, I meant, want to mention the zero G aircraft. Uh, this is the, how NASA, since 2008, has been doing all its suborbital research. Um, but, um, so they, they based in Ellington Field, Texas, which is near Johnson Space Center, but they do fly all over the country. And they offer uh, flights of microgravity for tourists. So if you have $5,000, you can get yourself a ticket, and you can uh, experience microgravity. And you can go here for the uh, uh, information. Um, I mentioned just show pictures of the FAST program. Um, which is the Facility Access to Space Environment for Technology. It's the NASA program that allows you to do research. And I'll talk a little bit about when we get to the, the, the last half of the talk. So I gave you a flavor, these five companies. And um, I want to also leave you with the message that they are not in competition with the other existing facilities. They're complementary. And speaking to you as, as users, I, that's I'm treating this audience we're scientists, we're engineers, we're technologists, we're educators, we want to use these vehicles. You ask yourself, what is my question? What is my problem that I want to solve? And then you say, what is the platform for me? So what you do as an engineer, you do a trade study, and you have all the different platforms, drop towers, sounding rockets, high altitude balloons, parabolic flights, the International Space Station, our national laboratory, which does amazing microgravity work, and also looking back at the Earth. And then now we have commercial orbit, commercial suborbital, just more facilities. Then what's your metric? What are you interested in? Do you need something that's, you know, what's your budget cost? How much time in microgravity do you experiment? If you're only interested in needing a few seconds, then you want to use one platform. If you need minutes or hours or weeks, use a totally different platform. Quality of microgravity, launch frequency, um, how often do you need to do your experiment? What sort of mass? Um, obviously, this is always, why is going to space expensive? Because launching mass into space is expensive. The more mass you have, the bigger the rocket you have to be, and that's just more expensive. And so learning to get your mass down is always good. But however, if you have some development that has big masses, you might only use certain platforms. How high do you need to go? What's the maximum load on reentry that you, your payload has to survive? And do you need a human in the loop? So if your metrics were low cost, long time, high quality, high frequency, low prep time, low mass, high altitude, low G, and to be human, that's what it would look like. You know, I would say, OK, I need to go choose that. So it's quite interesting that you know, we have this. And I wanted to say, these are all complementary to each other. Those other programs, the sounding rockets, the drop, top, drop towers, the parabolic aircrafts, the balloons, they're not going away. They will still be there. But now we have a new player to the table, a new approach. When you have a new approach, you have the potential to solve new problems. I also thought it's an interesting way to bring the raise the technology readiness level of your, your widget, your payload, such that it will fly on the ultimate experience, which is the satellite or the International Space Station. <coughs> so if your science falls into the category of the remote sensing satellite, you go on a high aircraft, high altitude aircraft, a scientific balloon a sounding rocket or commercial um, suborbital, and then eventually you'll go on to a satellite or the ISS. If you're a microgravity science, you're using a drop tower or a parabolic aircraft, a sounding rocket or the commercial suborbital, and then eventually you would go on to um, the satellite or the ISS. Oh, TRL is the technology readiness level. It is a gauge from 0 to 9, where 9 is we're flying into space all the time. 0 is just an idea. When you get up to TRL 4, you've tested your instrument in a lab environment. When you go from 4 to 5, you're taking it to the space environment. And then you continue to test it under different. Um, and this is a, this, that's a very good question, because I do talk about that, because that's um, the point behind the NASA's technology program is can we bridge this gap? Can we get the ideas that live in the laboratory and get it on that spacecraft? What do we do in between? So to sum up, <clears throat> commercial suborbital. 
Um, these are the ones I had already mentioned. The next big topic is what are NASA's roles? And I'm a NASA scientist, um, but I'm not actually in the program that is, is involved in the commercial suborbital. Um, and I thought this was a very fascinating thing to find out how NASA is to insert itself in this new arena. There are a lot of new players. So this uh, uh, image uh, is from um, Alexander Van Eek from, from Ames. And I, I, I think it's great. It's just taking this business mindset that I'm not normally used to seeing. It's a Venn diagram, as we all find just like diagrams. So you first have the, the users, this blue circle. Researchers, scientists, technologists, academics, educators, and potentially the government. Government could be a user. And then you have the suppliers. So this is this user supply and demand. These are your, uh, the vehicle providers. They could be the investors, or the investors in the company, or people who want to sell insurance for you to ride on these vehicles, or they're the providers of the vehicles, or they want to integrate the vehicle to the launch pad, or the payload to the launch vehicle, or they're building the spaceport. So there's all that going on. And then you have the government, which right now the big players are NASA and the, the FAA, because the FAA is involved in commercial transportation. And they've been very active at opening up spaceports and granting safety awards and um, evaluating um, things. So they're, they usually have these facilitary and regulatory rules, but sometimes they'll use and be a supplier. And we can't ignore the special interest groups. This is the entertainment industry, international, there's, you know, there's all these other things going on. So where's NASA falling in? NASA's falling in this area right here. There's this, you know, how do you get the, the research community talking to the investors? Now, they have their own conduits themselves outside of the government, and it's through this Commercial Space Flight Federation, um, which I have a slide on at the end, which is a very, uh, very uh, useful dialogue that's been going on between the research communities and the industry outside of the government. But then we've, uh, the NASA has slipped into this area to help get the communication going amongst the three, fostering a new industry. Um, to sort of lay the lines of why the program is structured the way it is, because from those who are familiar with NASA's Science Mission Directorate, this whole business of commercial suborbital is very different. And so I'm coming from wearing a hat of I've made proposals to NASA's Science Mission Directorate to get my payloads. I'm an instrument builder to get my payloads flying. If you want to do it through this, what I'm going to step you through is very different. And, and I just wanted to call attention to where commercial suborbital fell in NASA. It's under the office of the chief technologist. This is just an org chart of NASA. This is the chief technologist. And for those professional scientists in the in here, uh, we often get our our science um, paid for out of science mission directorate, or if we're doing a lot of life science or microgravity through the exploration system missions directorate. So the area where it's being shepherded is is in a different part of NASA, and this mainly affects the funding. It also affects the structure. But the other thing I wanted to point out is it's a it's a changing landscape. So nothing is really set in stone. So you had mentioned about TRO levels. This is what the whole office of the chief technologist wants to do. It wants to increase, so a higher TRL means you're flying. And so it wants to focus on um, the low TRL. Once you're in space, you're at eight or nine. And once you're below that, you're still in, I'm in an idea mode, I'm doing a breadboard, I'm moving on to actually putting it on a vehicle. And so it has these different categories, early stage, game changing, cross cutting. And this is the area where this commercial suborbital falls under, cruiser and fast, which has got recently renamed flight opportunities, um, which then is doing suborbital reusable launch vehicles, parabolic aircraft, and in the future, maybe orbital. Don't know, that's not quite set in stone yet. Again, it's sort of a, an idea of where this all falls. So if you are a scientist, you've been a, you like, like, wow, I want to learn more about this. I have a, an idea that I want to fly on one of these vehicles, what do you do? So this is the main site right now, is uh, flightopportunities.nasa.gov, and you go to it, see their mission statement. And this is a lot of words, but it talks about the program goals. And these are the players of the Cruiser and Fast program. Uh, they're led out of NASA Dryden, but NASA Ames here um, uh, is in charge of the payloads and the payload integration. And um, 
And so we have Dougal McLeese, whose name is up here. He's, he's here to answer questions if, uh, after my talk if you have any specifics about this uh, Flight Opportunities Program. Because I'm learning as I go, because I'm a user um, of, and finding this very thing very exciting. Um, it has had a history of being operated out of Johnson and Glenn. So this is all new, hot off the press. So it's been very active. There are these things called announcements of opportunity. Um, uh, how the Flight Opportunities Program is sending out their announcement opportunities, a little different than Rose's. It's a rolling call, meaning it's an open call. You can submit proposals at any time, and then periodically they gather up what they have and they see what they can match up. And their purpose is not to develop the payloads, but to buy flights. To buy flights on a parabolic aircraft or one of these suborbital vehicles. This is its um, role right now. Uh, at present, it's supporting the unmanned cruiser flights and the manned and unmanned parabolic flights. So uh, you go to the flight opportunities at nasa.gov. The next cutoff date is the end of this month. There'll be another cutoff date um, in a few months' time. But it's an open call all the way through December uh, 2014 is the current, uh, how it's established. This is how it got arranged. Call attention to the announcement that came out last month in which they mentioned the selections from the last go around. They had 16 experiments, and this is the breakdown 12 on periodic, uh, parabolic, two on these, uh, the vehicles. Right now, only Maston and Armadillo are flying, but you can imagine next year when we have more vehicles flying, it's going to be a growing, changing, uh, dynamic environment. So you have 12 parabolic, two on these vehicles, and two on both. So it's a, it's a good spread. Also, it's not a totally NASA. This is only three are NASA investigations. Seven are from non-NASA. They're from universities or companies. Um, again, NASA's role is not to tell these companies what to do. Um, it's just to you know get you know are we meeting the user in them as you know getting the industry talking to the users and facilitating it as best as it can. Um, and then some are combined. Uh, the breakdown, I should have said application, but I still think of it as science. We've got physics, some of the technology development, and then some of the biology. Um, the Flight Opportunities Program has offered, offered grants to the vendors. So it's offering grants to the users, the scientists, but also the vendors. So these companies are interested in this program. Um, and these are for services, to have these vendors provide payload services or flight services. And that proposal is due um, at the end of this month, very active on that. So finally, how can you get involved? And um, I'm hoping I'll leave you with the message that this is a very dynamic, changing, paradigm shifting, I don't know what the right buzzword of the day is. It's fascinating that we have these new vehicles that provide these new ways to access near space in different manners. And how can you get involved in that? Um, if you've flown an instrument on, a, on the space station, or you've done a parabolic flight before, or you've done a, a, a small sat, or you've done airborne science, maybe you know, repackage it for one of these suborbital vehicles. You don't know what you'll find if you sample it in a slightly different way, frequency, altitude, what have you. So the places where you can get involved is participate in these proposal opportunities. And it's, it's not as clear cut as Rose's. Okay, Rose's been around for a while. So this is a changing kind of way to go about trying to get your science done on these reusable vehicles. Um, if you're not of the government, you could join the Commercial Space Federation Research and Education Affiliates. This is, um, um, they do a lot of work for, they've only been around since like 2004, and uh, they do a lot of grants and FAA regulations and public advocacy, and they're working to make commercial space have certain industry safety standards, similar to what must have been done for the aircraft industry, you know, 50, 70 years ago. Um, so, uh, so that there's, there's this entity that's emerging. You can take a suborbital, payload suborbital training. There's actually an FAA accredited center that can put you through what you might experience if you go on one of these vehicles to attend your science and attend conferences. Um, and I'll talk about the NSRC. And I'm talking about the you, meaning we're all scientists, educators, researchers, users. We're interested in using these vehicles to help us solve our problems. How do you, as you're a scientist, we live and die by the grant proposal. So how are you going to do this? There's really not a fixed path. Seriously, there's not a fixed path. 
The Flight Opportunity Program is trying to model itself in the same spirit of, an, of a program that the airborne scientists use. So if you're an airborne scientist in the audience here, um, if you're going to use a high altitude aircraft, you go through your normal SMD path and you buy your flight services through the SOFRS program. If your flight opportunities for commercial suborbital, you go through flight opportunities on NASA.gov. However, if you're a sounding rocket or a balloon, you go through your established ROSES grants as you've done in the past. So those things are not going away. So I figured out, and this is, I call it beta, because I'm just trying to figure out how this works, because if you read any of these opportunities, you know, eyes are crossing, because they're different, they're worded differently. So right now, there, it's, a, it's an area in flux of how you go about to get your scientific payload on a commercial suborbital vehicle. And this is how I see it. This is most my opinion on how I read the documents. And it's going to change. And I, I call out that the colored boxes here are established funding. It means it's sort of in the system. And the boxes that have hashed marks means we don't quite know how it's all going to play out. And there's three paths right now. One is if you get your normal funding through NASA. Um, and you would apply to the Office of the Chief Technologist, or if you're life sciences or microgravity, you would eventually go through SOMD. Um, and if you're doing Earth or space science, you go through SMD. The check marks are sort of to represent the peer review process, because this is another place where you want to be, you want to be good stewards of science, and you want to have the peer review process get you good <coughs> proposals. And so the check marks are sort of to represent like how many proposals you need to write. So if you're going through NASA SMOD, which exists right now, there is a call that says certain areas are applicable to Cruiser. You get peer reviewed, and then you get money to build your instrument, and design your interface, and then you have a Cruiser review, which you then you know, works out the interfaces to the, the providers. You get dumped into the flight opportunities call. You don't need to do a second proposal there because you've already been selected by NASA SMD. Um, where the flight opportunities group will do a compatibility check, a flight profile, and a safety review. You get your flight, you get your data, and maybe you fly multiple times. I mean, again, this is one of the ways that this is how, or if you get enough flight, you might want to propose again, you have your instrument existing, but a year later you want to run it again. You just write a, now you write a proposal to the flight opportunities call, and you take your data. And then eventually, you pop out, you get a new idea, and you start the whole process. So you're looking at writing one to two proposals. It's a little bit complicated. Oops. If we get down to, like if you're not going through NASA, and this is the, the interesting thing. OK, now, this is where you can sort of, like if you're interested by this, we don't have funding. There's not established funding through NSF, NIH, DOD, space grants, or what have you, to fund your payloads. You've got to sort of convince them this is kind of neat because the vehicles are, you know, are starting to fly, but you know, you're waiting for, you know, where these Pathfinder payloads going on right now are really paving ahead a new way of doing things. So how this is supposedly going to work is if you find some funding, you build your instruments, you've got your peer review process, and then out pops an instrument, which the entrance criteria to flight opportunities is TRL4, which is component and or bread bread board validation in laboratory environment. So they want to accept things that have been at least tested in a lab. So you're not putting something on the rocket for the very first time because you want to make good use of your facility. So you're, you enter here, and then you have, since you're coming from outside NASA, you will be vetted again by uh, the flight opportunity. So in this case, you're writing two proposals. But the same mantra is the same thing. And all flight opportunities right now is purchasing flights. Now, eventually, this is where it's going to go, and you can even do this today if you have lots of money, is, and there's nothing prohibiting you from doing this. Uh, so you have your idea, and you win your grants, you have a proposal, and you build your instrument and your instrument base, and you just go directly to the vehicle and buy your flight. You don't have to go through flight opportunities. It's only there if you're a poor university grad student who can't afford. You know, these vehicles are all different prices, too. Uh, so NASA's providing a way to buy your airline ticket. You know, uh, Dougal's reference of, is the travel agent. You know, in the past, you would, you know, if you went to your vacation in the Caribbean uh, before the internet, you'd have to go to the travel agency. And the travel agency filled out all these brochures, you know, want to go to this beach or this villa or things like that. And they would go and buy the flights for you. And then you would just show up and enjoy your vacation. 
Nowadays, we just go directly to, you know, Cancun with all the different resorts and do it ourselves. And that's sort of the image that they, this Flight Opportunities Program wants the industry to go. Right now, there's a brokerage going on because they're still trying to support the burgeoning industry, try to get, educate us that these are going to be available. Let's do some, make sure that this, the interfaces are good. We're not going to be, you know, especially when they do a compatibility check, because on a, some of these vehicles, you'll have multiple payloads on the same vehicle. So you want to do some basic compliance checks. Are we going to interfere with each other? When we do this in the spacecraft business, and it works out very well. So there's some, you know, we're lesson, you know, learning from our past. So yes, in the, and you can do this now. You can purchase your own uh, flights and fly them. You don't need to go through NASA from that. This is just different ways to get your, your flights. This is a reminder that if you have something ready to go and just need to buy a flight, NASA provides flights. And you, you would submit a, um, a proposal. And you've got zero G and then Armadillo and Mastin at this type of access. So as the time rolls by, there'll be more vehicles. They'll have more different profiles, how high they go, how long they go, and see how it's suitable. Other ways for you to get involved, the Commercial Space Flight Federation I mentioned before. This is their website, commercialspaceflight.org. They have this research um, affiliate membership. So I think it's at a lower cost than the actual companies that join this, but it gives you uh, an update into what they're working on and how you can get involved. Again, starting to be, be active participants in emerging commercial space. If you're interested in training, you can go to the NASTER Center, the National Aerospace Training and Research Center. It's in Philadelphia. They have training centrifuges. They have simulations. They train a lot of military pilots in off-nominal scenarios. And they, in April of 2010, they won a safety approval from the FAA to allow them to provide training um, services. Um, if you were fortunate enough to buy a ticket on Virgin Galactic as a tourist, or if you want to be flying your own science um, experiment in Virgin Galactic, I believe they're going to have like a whole mission profile of it so you can go and practice there. So when it comes to the real thing, you've gotten a lot of your practice ahead of time. Um, I have several colleagues who've done this training. It's the suborbital um, training class. It's a three-day program. You just need an FA um, medical, a simple medical to attend. Um, but then you learn about how to do your science experiment when you're in a short time period with lots of distractions and to make the most of it for the human tended one. Finally, to wrap up, is uh, participate in these conferences. Um, there's only been, it's this next generation suborbital researcher conferences. Uh, they just started in 2010. Uh, it's a combination of the universities and the industries and the government all talking together. I attended this one, the one in Orlando. I found it very fascinating to listen to all the conversations going on, what, how the vendors were talking to the users and how the government was talking to the vendors. It was all these different conversations going on. I mean, it was the energy in the room. We just don't know how all this is going to pan out. And you guys are lucky because guess what? It's here next year. So it's moving around the country. So save the date. Next Generation uh, Suborbital Researchers Conference 2012 is in February of next year. It's going to be co-hosted with NASA Ames. Um, they're gonna, because the venue is going to be several hundred people, we'll probably be in a hotel in Palo Alto. Uh, abstracts are due in November. This is the website, nsrcswiri.edu. And for uh, scientists in the audience who go to the AGU, there's going to be a special session at the AGU this December. And that's 5 through 9 December. It's, good. it's an interesting topic. Mesosphere, low thermosphere, and pollution science with reu reusable suborbital vehicles. This is another interesting area of study, is understanding how these vehicles interact with our fragile environment. And some of the rockets that are being developed are green energy, and others aren't. But they all have different inter interfaces. And we're going to be flying in the higher, just like we have airplanes flying in the stratosphere, we're going to be touching different parts of our atmosphere and studying how we want to study that, and monitor it, and uh, continue that. That's my last slide, which has lots of links to it, um, pointing out for uh, flight opportunities at NASA.gov. And there's a mailing list you can subscribe to that gets you some you know, things that are happening in the industry. Obviously, you can go to all the different websites of, of all the companies. Um, I, in fact, I can't show all of them. 
Um, if you want to do an airborne payload or sounding rockets or balloons, they still have their old sites that you can go and find out the current state of those uh, programs. Um, I mentioned the next generation. Blogs are fun. Uh, Flight Opportunities runs a really, uh, really interesting blog that combines all the different companies. Um, but then there's some other ones that um, I've stumbled upon um, learning about this field. Again, I don't come from this field. I just learned about it just talking to people and finding out, wow, there's new ways of doing things. If you're on Facebook and Twitter, uh, there's a whole bunch of, and I didn't mention all the Twitter handlers. I think all the, all the different companies um, have that. And so fly early, fly often, and fly safe. I hope you yeah, enjoyed my talk. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. First question. Uh, you mentioned that it's possible to uh, fly with your instrument on the Virgin Galactic uh, aircraft, um, Spaceship Two. Are they envisioning something like you're sitting next to your instrument? Um, are they going to cater for you? Is scientists to have like an instrument bay right next to them, or, or what sort of things are they thinking of there? No, well, it's, it's a good question, and there's a lot of dialogue over that because there's a dialogue. I mean, Virgin Galactic allows six people. Um, so you can actually have six researchers on. Or maybe if your research experiment is the size of a human, you might buy a seat for that kind of thing. And they might be close to it. And so there's a lot of dialogue on, do you share the same flight with tourists who will be moving about and bumping around and, cre and disturbing your microgravity? Um, so there's a lot of dialogue on, do you want your instrument next to you? Or maybe your instrument is attached to the outside of the vehicle and you don't need to be near it. You just need to be near a console and need to point it. Um, so it really is instrument specific. But there is a lot of dialogue going on with that. The other piloted one is x -Corp, which there's only two people. There's a pilot and there's a researcher. So it's a little bit more straightforward. But you still have to, just like if you've been in a two-seater aircraft and you're always talking to the pilot, you're still going to have another human in the loop and how to have that happen. Um, but I, don't know, I mean, yeah, so that's it's a good question. The human factors people are having fun with this. The, uh, the commercial entities that you mentioned are all US-based. What's the parallel in Europe? And is ESA sponsoring this kind of opportunity? Very good question. At that conference I was at in March, they invited a lot of the Euro uh, internationals who have the background in sounding rockets and balloons to come. And right now they, um, uh, they're looking, they're not, um, how do I say that? The leading entity will probably be Spaceport Sweden, um, which has been flying uh, sounding rockets. But we're planning to, to house one of the Virgin Galactic planes there and fly Virgin Galactic services out of that. So they're not developing their own. They're, they're basically using what Virgin Galactic is, is building upon. Um, ESA is not, uh, doesn't uh, have any program for commercial suborbital research vehicles. They do still have the parabolic flights and support the drop tests. Hi. Um, <clears throat> about that uh, chart that showed all the different uh, platforms for suborbital. You included high altitude balloons, but you listed them as unmanned. And there was a guy who jumped out of a high altitude balloon in 1960, Joe Kittinger. Okay. Um, I thought there was interest in that in the late 90s, maybe year 2000. But has anyone else jumped except for Joe? <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, there was a plan to do a high altitude jump to break his record for altitude and speed. And there were some issues between the original proposer and the company that kind of took that proposal to sponsor it and then eventually broke off from him. So there's a bit of a legal battle going. There's also a commercial company in Barcelona who's uh, planning a, a tourism version of, uh, of a, a parachute return from a high altitude balloon. Oh, right. OK. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, the, the entire capsule is under a parachute. OK, OK. I haven't seen you since Oh, thank you. Thank you. Another 
Yeah, I noticed you had uh, FAA listed. As you do some of these flights and they cross over other countries, are there joint issues around regulatory or safety or what's happening in that area? Um, well, not being an expert there, but I have been reading some of the documents. It is true that, you know, there's like a company rocket plane that really wants to do uh, point to point. I mean, it's not all these, mo all these ones I mentioned here just come up and come down at the same place. They have limited range, so it's easier. And they're writing all the regulatory activities for that now. But in the future, that is certainly something that I've, I, I was reading. There was, if you go to the FAA website, to the Office of Space Commercial Transport, they have a document from 2005 that they're updating to just address this because it is an issue. I mean, you're going to be crossing different types of airspace, and how are you going to do that? So it is going to be FAA's or, and also the international um, challenge. But it's all I know is that the, that's, the, that's the, gov the U.S. government working on that would be the FAA. So I've got a simple question. Where did the word sounding come from? Sounding? The For sounding rocket? Yeah, sounding. What's the word sounding mean? Oh, yeah? That's under sea, isn't it? You know, you just yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, but the sea is just another fluid. You know, the atmosphere is just a fluid. <laughs> the scientist is just a fluid. It's a good question. I want to know that too. It's sounding. Kim, do you know if uh, SpaceX has got any interest in doing suborbital stuff? I don't know. I mean, I, I also didn't mention all these other companies that are doing commercial space, like SpaceX and um, Sierra Nevada and all these others. I don't know if they're doing suborbital. I know they're focusing on their low-cost launch vehicles and their orbital program with the Dragon capsule for um, visiting the space station. Um, but I don't know about their suborbital. Because when you, when you design, when you have the mindset to do a suborbital spacecraft, you design it for that. You have the re-entry and the flexibility and the fact that you can do a quick turnaround in the mindset from the design up front. So like Blue Origin has a suborbital and an orbital path. And they have, their vehicles are going down slightly different paths because orbital has different thermal constraints and versus the suborbital lifetime constraints. So you'd have to have the mindset. But I don't know about um, SpaceX. Uh, as a special uh, uh, oh. thank you from uh, all of us here at the SET Institute for your talk today, Kim. It's an antique SETI mug. Uh, Wonderful. So please join me in thanking Kim for a great Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your questions.